Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 745 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. Just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. And the Rangers, it is Sunday morning as I'm recording this. The Rangers coming off of a disappointing 4-3 overtime loss in New Jersey against the Devils. That snaps the Rangers three-game winning streak at 3 and I'm not going to, like, sound the alarms just because, you know, the Rangers lost a hockey game. But, but let's be real here. That's a game that the Rangers should have won. They pretty much had it in hand. They had mostly total control of the game uh, through the first 40 minutes, up 3-1 to one going into the third period. Uh, was not perfect. You know, the Rangers got a little bit laxed defensively in the second period. Devils got some opportunities out of that. But Igor Shesterkin saved the Rangers bacon a couple of times in that middle stanza there. And bottom line, up by two goals. Uh, you're in good position to win the game, regardless of how you got there. And of course, the Rangers were not able to maintain that lead. The Devils tie it, goes to overtime, and the Devils win it. And there's a lot to talk about here. Going to mention Igor Shesterkin and his awesome game. Uh, It's one of those games where, you know, the box score is a little bit misleading because you see that he gives up four goals and you think he didn't have his best stuff. But uh, he was awesome in this game and uh, really got put in a couple of bad spots by some of his teammates. So got to talk about that a little bit. Although, you know, Igor was going to be the lead. If the Rangers had won this game, you know, I probably would have opened talking about Igor and his outstanding game, and now it basically just becomes a footnote due to everything else that happened in the final 20 minutes and in overtime. But something else I just want to throw out there that's a really bizarre trend between the Rangers and Devils so far this season, they've played three times. In all three games, one team or the other built a 2 to nothing lead, and all three times, the team that went up 2 to nothing has lost the game. So just one of the more uh, strange trends that you'll see early in a season. Uh, Rangers-Devils games over these past couple of years, even when both teams are struggling, have tended to be pretty crazy. Uh, you know, the, the intensity's there, and I hesitate to throw out that, oh man, this, this was like a playoff game. I, I don't say that very often, because then you go to the playoffs and you realize, no, this is a playoff game. You know, there is a whole other uh, level that it goes to, but if I was going to say that about, you know, the Rangers and any other team in the regular season this year, even last year, last couple of years, if there's a team that the Rangers play where it consistently feels like a playoff type of game, I, I do think it's the Devils. These, these games tend to be uh, pretty nuts, and my notes tend to be out of control when these games are over. I take more notes for Rangers Devils than uh, any other team that they're playing just because so much seems to happen in these games. But to kind of keep things on track here and uh, get back from our brief detour there, uh, you know, the Rangers, obviously, it's a disappointing loss, but we got a lot to talk about as far as things that happen in this game. I want to talk about the decision to bump Barclay Goodrow onto the second line down the stretch in this game and replace Kravtsov and essentially uh, bench Kravtsov, Blay, and uh, Gauthier for Most of the third period, the Rangers were kind of just rolling with three lines there. I also want to talk about Julian Gauthier a little bit and how he's having uh, one of the best seasons of his career. You'd have to say it is the best season of his career, and uh, you have to wonder what he could do with a little bit more ice time, even though it's hard to see how you can move him up. Um, But tough game for Alexi Lafreniere. I want to talk about that as well. Uh, I want to break down everything that went wrong in the third period and uh, give Igor Shesterkin some props for, again, a really strong performance in this one despite the loss. But we talk about the third period uh, to start today's episode here. So there's a play I want to mention that happened early in the third. And again, the Rangers are up 3-1 to one going into the final 20 minutes here. Kravtsov wins a loose puck and got the pass to Panarin. And Panarin had a great opportunity here. Came somewhat close to potentially making this a 4-1 to Ranger lead. Uh, his shot... Uh, was on the backhand, and it went high, and I, I believe it deflected out of play. And it is just one play here, but Kravtsov, again, getting the puck, getting it quickly to Panarin, setting up, you know, the Rangers' most talented player for a great scoring opportunity. I want you to remember that play because it's going to come into play a little bit later when we talk about uh, the idea of moving Goodrow onto the second line instead of Kravtsov, because I think that was Kravtsov. It might have been his last uh, shift of the game. Uh, I'm not sure if he saw the ice after that. So we're going to talk about that, but to keep uh, talking about the third period here, so the Rangers get a power play opportunity, and they're not able to convert, and that's another uh, reason, one of the many reasons why the Rangers ended up losing this game. They go 0-2 on the power play. The Devils go 1-4, for and the Rangers, again, another opportunity here in the third period to extend their lead to 4-1. to Never say never. The game's not over for sure, but if you're up 4-1 to with, you know, 15 or so minutes left in the game, I-, I think you probably like your chances, but the Rangers were not able to convert. The Devils got a power play opportunity right after this. Uh, Capo Caco took a slash, and and 
Jesper Brat ends up scoring for the Devils to cut the lead to 3-2. to So basically a two-goal swing there. You've got a chance if you're the Rangers to convert on the power play, which the Rangers need to do more of. They've been up and down with the power play all season. And, you know, they've been pretty good recently, but I'm looking for this power play to go on a run and really play like the top-notch unit that it should be. I, I want the Rangers from, you know, we're halfway through the season here. I want to see them have like a top-five power play unit in the final 41 games. There's no reason they shouldn't be able to do that uh, with the personnel that they have on their top unit. But they weren't able to convert. The Devils were. And just like that, it's a 3-2 to lead for the Rangers. And uh, obviously, at this point, it's anybody's game. Then the Devils tie the game. They got a little bit of a lucky bounce here. They won the faceoff, and you have Hughes scoring from the right circle. Uh, there was a shot by the Devils from the blue line, and it was blocked, took a deflection, went right to Hughes. I mean, you couldn't have passed it over there any better uh, than, you know, this deflection resulted in, you know, going over there to Hughes there. Um, so he scores. It's 3-3. Three to three. And then you get a slashing penalty on Vincent Trocek, but the score still tied at 3-3. Three to three. I really like Trocek. He was uh, one of my top, he was my top free agent target for the Rangers uh, this offseason. There was some conjecture, you know, Trocek or Strom or Kopp, who should they go with? They go with Trocek, and I think that was the wise decision there. He takes some dumb penalties, and it's been happening a lot recently, and it needs to stop. I mean, this cannot be happening, especially in a situation like this. You're in a spot here where you're losing control of the game. The Devils have scored twice. It's now 3-3 three to three instead of 3-1, three to one. and Trocek, you know, he argued the penalty, and was it called a little bit tight? I mean, maybe, but you watch the replay. He slashed the guy. I mean, there's no two ways about it. He slashed the stick right out of his opponent's hand, and he heads to the penalty box. Fortunately, the Rangers were able to uh, you know, kill off this power play opportunity for the Devils, and that is at least part of the reason then why this game ends up going into overtime, where you know at least the Rangers got a point. But uh, be that as it may, not a good penalty by Trocek there, and just not a good third period by the Rangers in general. There were too many times, especially in the third period, but at other times in this game, uh, including the miscue by Barclay Goodrow, where the Rangers just kind of shot themselves in the foot. And credit to the Devils, I guess. You know, they, they took advantage of these uh, opportunities that the Rangers gift-wrapped at them. But, you know, the Rangers just weren't as sharp as they needed to be, and uh, they let this game get away from them, and that was really unfortunate. We're also going to talk about uh, the overtime period as a whole when we talk about Alexi Lafreniere uh, a little bit later in today's episode and uh, talk about what was obviously a, kind of a tough afternoon uh, for Laf. Uh, but we're going to get to that and a whole lot more in just a second. But first, got to let everybody know, today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 because I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great, and I wanted to see what all the hype was about. Now, I've been on it for about eight months, and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy, has kind of a mild tropical taste that I actually look forward to each morning. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you are absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, nervous system, immune system, energy recovery, focus, and aging. It is lifestyle-friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health, and it is cheaper than your cold brew habit. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And we just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. So I alluded to a couple of Ranger miscues, a couple of mistakes that in some cases led to some Devils goals or at the very least some good scoring opportunities for the Devils in this game. And there's one here uh, that stood out like a sore thumb by Barclay Goodrow. Now, let me just preface this whole thing by saying that I'm still a fan of Barclay Goodrow. Uh, I saw some uh, 
I don't want to say hate, that's too strong of a word, but some people were fed up with, with Barclay Goodrow and the, the play that he made here. Overall, he's had a really nice season to the Rangers, though, and a very well-rounded player, but this was awful. You will not see a turnover uh, much worse than this. Barclay Goodrow has the puck in the neutral zone, and for some reason, he inexplicably decides to pass the puck back into the Ranger zone to, I'm assuming, one of the two defensemen that were on the ice. Uh, that was Braden Schneider or Ben Harper. I don't know why Goudreau, I mean, he was right at the red line. He could have just, you know, moved over the red line and dumped the puck into the zone. He could have just held onto the puck. He could have tried to pass to one of his fellow forwards, and for some reason, he throws it uh, back down the ice into the Rangers zone, and unfortunately, uh, the worst player that could possibly be there just so happened to be there. That was Jack Hughes. I mean, again, I mentioned, you know, how Hughes got a fortunate bounce uh, in the game in the third period. Uh, if you were Jack Hughes' teammate, you could not have made a better pass to him than Barclay Goodrow made here. Uh, basically hit him in stride, let him into the Rangers zone, and Hughes split the two defensemen, Harper and Schneider, and he scored. I saw pe some people, like, blaming Harper and Schneider for being too far apart on this play. Like, dude, you're not expecting your teammate to spring your opponent's best player on a breakaway. I don't see the logic there where anybody could put this on either Schneider or Harper. Uh, just a bad play by Goodrow, and I think he'll be the first one to tell you that. And just so weird because he's like the last player on the Rangers that I would think would do something like this. But that got the Devils back into the game, uh, cut the Ranger lead to 2-1. to one. And I mentioned the play by Kravtsov that he made in the third period where he won the loose puck and set up Panarin for the great scoring opportunity. Again, that would have made it 4-1 to one Rangers. And then all of a sudden, after Kravtsov made that nice play, and after Barkley Goodrow had made, again, one of the worst plays that you'll see, one of the worst turnovers that you'll see, and I, I like Goodrow, but I'm calling it like I see it. It was absolutely awful. Let's just be honest here. Um, so after that happened, a good play by Kravtsov on what I think was his last shift of the game, and after a god-awful turnover by Barkley Goodrow, the Rangers and Gallant, especially, particularly, decides to go with Barkley Goodrow on the second line uh, for most of the third period instead of of Krasov. Now, there are times when we've seen Gallant make this this change late in games, uh, you know, putting Goodrow on the second line and uh, taking Krasov out of there. And there are times when it makes sense. I think in most situations where the Rangers have, you know, they're up by a goal, maybe two goals in the third period. You want to tighten up the defense a little bit. Uh, get Krasov out of there, put Barclay Goodrow with Panarin and with Trocek. Goodrow's known as a really good defensive forward. Krasov really isn't, and he's still getting his feet wet at the NHL level anyway. So in that situation, it makes sense. You know, I do think Gallant tends to be a little bit too trigger happy when it comes to juggling his lines, but at least when he does that, that's something that I think is kind of premeditated, and it makes a lot of sense. You know, you're tightening up your defense while you're trying to protect a lead late in the game. But in this case, you know, he rewards Goodrow despite, you know, a terrible play, and he takes Krausoff off of the second line, where I thought Krausoff, you know, had a decent game overall. I mean, nothing that really stood out that much, but I feel like Krausoff is coming along slowly but surely. It's not showing up as far as points are concerned, but, you know, again, to take him out here and put Goodrow in that spot, it didn't make as much sense as it normally would, given the, the miscue that Goodrow had earlier in this game, and it didn't make any sense once the Devils had tied the game. If you want to do that and put Goodrow onto the second line when the Rangers are up by goal, up by two goals, okay, fine. At least you can, at least there's logic there. At least it makes some sense. But once the Devils had tied the game, I didn't really see the point of having Goodrow there instead of crafts off. You know, if you're going to do that, then you might as well just have Goodrow on the second line the entire game, and I guess have crafts off on the fourth line. I'm not even sure how that would affect things. I mean, I, I guess one of the reasons why you can't do that right now if you're the Rangers is because you only have four uh, centers in, in your lineup. So to do that would leave the fourth line without a center. So I guess I kind of just answered my own question there. But be that as it may, didn't really think it was necessary to, to take Krauss off out of that spot there and put Goudreau there after he had made a really bad mistake. And I usually don't go to the place I'm about to go either, but I have to believe there are certain players on this Ranger team, if they made a play that Goudreau made, you know, that really bad turnover, let's just say it would have affected their ice time down the stretch. I think Krasov is a prime example of somebody that it probably would have uh, hurt his ice time had he done something like that. Just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I also want to go ahead and talk about what was uh, a difficult game for Alexi Lafreniere. And uh, we're going to get to that and a couple of other things in just a second. I uh, also want to end with a couple of positives today, that being uh, Jimmy Vesey coming through the goal, Julian Gauthier coming through the goal, and Gauthier really finding a way to be an effective player on the fourth line, something that I didn't really think he 
uh, really had the skill set to do. Uh, but he's finding a way this season and, you know, playing better than I, I think a lot of us probably thought that he would, uh, given his relative lack of production in the past. But we're going to get to all that good stuff in just a second. But first, I just got to let everybody know, today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league. From pro football to college bowl season to basketball and hockey, we've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. We are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, so as promised, wanted to go ahead and talk about what was uh, kind of a tough game for Alexi Lafreniere, and, you know, he had the healthy scratching not too long ago and hasn't really uh, done a whole lot since he's been back. I mean, I know he's on the third line, but uh, getting not a ton of ice time, but enough that you'd like to see him do a little bit more. But as for this game against the Devils, to kind of just go through his stat line real quick, and then we'll break down some of the bigger plays that he was involved in. Um, But you've got Uh, 14 minutes and 42 seconds of ice time for Lafreniere. That includes 50 seconds on the power play. Uh, He did have an assist, a primary assist in this game on the Rangers' first goal of uh, the afternoon. He was an even plus minus, had two shots on goal, two hits, one blocked shot. Um, And might as well go ahead and go through the assist that he had because this was a nice play. Uh, You had Jimmy Vesey scoring in the uh, first period, just a minute 34 into the action. Jacob Truba moving uh, the puck through the neutral zone. Lafreniere receives the pass along the boards and uh, right near uh, the team benches, actually, and uh, basically just deflects a pass into the attacking zone and centers it for Vesey. And a great play by Jimmy Vesey here. We might as well talk about the goal while we're on this play here. Uh, but VZ had a chance to uh, to shoot and did not do it and instead uh, moved laterally across, you know, the slot area there, and then he shot. And as soon as VZ made that move and delayed with the puck, I said count it. I just had a feeling that he was going to uh, score once he decided to delay with the puck a little bit, get the goalie moving a little bit, and eventually uh, flicks the puck right by him into the net, just like that. The Rangers up one nothing, just 134 into the action. So that was a nice play by Lafreniere, but other than that, not a whole lot. I mean, on top of just being not all that visible during this game and not really involved in too many other uh, scoring opportunities for the Rangers, uh, had a couple of plays very late in this game. Once was late in the third period. One was in overtime that stood out and uh, unfortunately not in a positive way. So it's 3-3 three to three at this point. We're down to about 2.30 or so to go in the game. Uh, you know, just fast pace, up and down hockey. It's clearly a game that can still go either way. You've got Philip Heedle making a nice play on the forecheck, basically just takes the puck away, makes a centering pass to Alexi Lafreniere in the slot, and uh, Lafreniere got the shot away, but could not score. It, it looked like uh, what happened was Vanacek uh, juggled the puck a little bit, and then it popped into the air, but then he caught it. So Lafreniere, I mean, look, nobody's automatic. Nobody's going to score on every single opportunity like this. But, man, that was a big spot in the game, and that would have been a huge moment for Alexi Lafreniere, a game where the Rangers were up by two goals, gave it away to put them back on top here and potentially send them on their way to a win with what could have turned out to be the game-winning goal. No guarantees, still about 2.30 to go. Devils would have had a chance to tie it, but you're in good shape there, and obviously it would have been a huge moment for Lafreniere, and he's just not able to capitalize there. Not the end of the world. I mean, again, nobody's going to score on every single chance that they get, and Lafreniere did not score here. But then in overtime... Uh, This was not good. A pretty eventful overtime period in general. And Lafreniere has the puck moving up the left side, gaining the blue line. Obviously, it's three on three, so you got a lot of space out there. He's got Philip Hedl joining the rush with him. Philip Hedl is to his right, kind of in the center of the ice. And Lafreniere slows down. When he goes to pass, Severson basically just takes it away from him. And after this happens, you know, just a split second after, you got Sharon Govich, you know, he's approaching Lafreniere, and the two of them crash into each other, and they both go flying to the ice. And since Philip Hedl had joined the rush, it's now a two-on-one the other way uh, for the Devils. Severson's got the puck. He goes in. Adam Fox is back. Tried to take away the pass is what it looked like, but uh, Severson takes the shot, and he scores, and the Devils win in overtime. And just not a good result for the Rangers. Again, when you're up by two goals going into the third, you want to win that game. And unfortunately, Lafreniere involved in a couple of negative plays uh, down the stretch here for the Rangers. And I'll say this too. I tend not to fixate too much on like Jack Hughes versus Capo Caco or Jack Hughes versus Alexi Lafreniere. I mean, to me, it, it doesn't really matter that much, you know, unless the Rangers are playing the Devils, then it matters. But 
Um, you know, I, I don't get too obsessed with like, oh man, this guy that was drafted seventh overall, he's playing so much better than the guy that was drafted fifth overall. And I, I don't really get too worked up in it because, it, you know, bottom line is whenever you were drafted, it is what it is. And, you know, if you're the Rangers, you want to bring Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco along. It doesn't really matter what Jack Hughes is doing. And of course, there's nothing the Rangers could have done. They couldn't have taken Jack Hughes anyway. But I will say, watching this game, it does, it is kind of tough because Jack Hughes in this game ends up with two goals and an assist. He had a hand in all three of the Devils' first three goals that they scored. And you see the season that he's having right now. I mean, he's racking up goals like nobody's business, and he's showing an ability to take over games. Now, Capo Caco has played a lot better recently. I do think with every passing season, and he's now in year four, Capo Caco has improved as a player. I think his confidence has grown quite a bit. I think he's really clicked with Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider. A little bit of a quiet game in this one, maybe. Um, but he has played a lot better, and he's starting to look like he's going to become the player that the Rangers thought they were drafting. But whether it's Caco or whether it's Lafreniere, we got to be honest with ourselves. We don't see from those two players, at least not nearly as often as we see this from Jack Hughes, where... You know, they just go out there and just look like world beaters and look like guys, they're going to take over a game. We don't. I mean, we, we have to be honest about this. And at some point, you just keep hoping that uh, eventually Kako, who's getting there, and also Lafreniere can uh, reach that level. Because, you know, with Lafreniere right now, I mean, rough game here. He had the healthy scratching not too long ago. We are at the point where we are exactly at the halfway point in the season. We are 41 games through the season. And to this point, I mean, again, flashes here and there, a good game here, a good game there. Alexi Lafreniere has not really gotten his season off the ground, at least as of yet. And I realize a lot of people are going to point at Gerard Gallant and say, well, you know, he never gets in the top six. He never has the same two line mates for two games in a row. Uh, he doesn't get a lot of time on the power play. That's all true. And, you know, to an extent, that probably does negatively affect Alexi Lafreniere. But this is somebody that coming into the league was labeled a generational talent, the best player available since Sidney Crosby. That's what people were saying about Alexi Lafreniere, and he just doesn't show that enough. You don't see enough from Alexi Lafreniere, whether it's shooting, uh, passing, or you know skating ability for sure. You don't see it at an elite level nearly as often as you would have thought that you would see it based on everything that was being said about this kid when he came into the league. Now, I'm not ready to hit the panic button. I still think Alexi Lafreniere can be a good player. I still think sooner or later he's going to force the issue a little bit. He's got to get his confidence back, though, and uh, you know, just basically start playing a little bit better than he is right now because um, that was not a good game at all for Alexi Lafreniere. And again, I would like to see him eventually get some opportunities. You know, the Ranger power play went into a heck of a slump for a while there, and one thing that it seems like Gallant will never do is touch the top power play unit and try somebody else there, whether it's Kako or Hedl or Lafreniere. Uh, could be a way to get one of those guys going in certain situations, or you know, there could be a spot where they just need a little bit of a shakeup. So I'd, I'd like to see, maybe at some point, if the Ranger power play goes into a slump, maybe Lafreniere gets a chance. You could use that as a way to kind of spark him, get him going a little bit. Uh, we'll see. But right now, I mean, yeah, you know, Lafreniere, they need more from him. I, I realize it's only the third year. He still is just 21 years old, and hope is not lost here. Uh, but that was a little bit of a rough game. And it is tough to see, you know, Jack Hughes go out there and just skating circles around everybody and just not seeing that enough, uh, certainly from Lafreniere and even Kako to a lesser extent. And Kako has been very good. I love what I've seen from Capo Kako this year. And I do think he's right there on the verge of becoming uh, the player or at least very, very close to the player that the Rangers uh, thought they were drafting. But, you know, it's one of those things you want them to get there a little bit quicker and you want to see uh, just them looking dangerous the way that Jack Hughes Basically, he looks dangerous every time he's on the ice, because I won't lie to you guys. I hold my breath every single time he's out there, every single time he's got the puck on his stick. And uh, that's kind of where things stand right now. You're hoping that uh, certainly Lafreniere and Kako, to a lesser extent, can eventually uh, get to that level. But I want to end today on a little bit of a positive here and talk about how uh, the Rangers, when it comes to secondary scoring, they have seemingly solved that issue from earlier in the season. You know, the first handful of games, you know, 15 games, 20 games, however many games you want to, you know, draw the, the limit at, draw the line at, there was a situation with the t this team where if one of the top five guys was not contributing offensively, we had no idea where it was going to come from. If, if it wasn't Panarin, Fox, Mika, Kreider, or Trocek, so basically the top power play unit, 
I, I mean, where who was going to score? Who was going to get an assist? Who was even going to look dangerous out there for the Rangers? But the thing that I like is uh, guys have stepped up since then. We've seen uh, Keandre Miller start racking up some points. Trub has gotten some assists recently. Uh, Brayden Shire has been scoring goals recently and, and looking like an, an offensive threat himself. Those are just the defensemen. When you turn your attention to the forwards, uh, Philip Hedl has stepped up a little bit. Kako has certainly stepped up. And even guys that you know, coming into the season, we weren't even sure they were going to be on the Rangers. You know, Gautier had to pass through waivers to go to the AHL. He was sent down to the minors. Um, he had asked for a trade in the offseason, and Jimmy Vesey was in on a PTO, and both those guys score uh, a couple of pretty goals in this game here for the Rangers. So it's just been really nice to uh, to see those guys step up in those roles. Now, we already talked about the Vesey goal when we were talking about Lafreniere, but I did want to talk a little bit about uh, the Gautier goal. This made it two to nothing. Uh, he is now up to six goals on the season, scored on a breakaway here, and six goals for somebody who, you know, does not log a ton of minutes, for somebody who was in the minors for a short spell, for somebody who's been a healthy scratch at times this season, not too shabby for Jimmy V or uh, yeah, Jimmy VZ. Well, he's been good too, but I'm talking about Julian Gauthier. Uh, six goals and three assists for nine points in 30 games. It's, again, it's not a ton, but when you look at the lack of ice time and you look at, you know, the lack of games, I mean, he's only played in 30 of the 41 games this season. I think you'll take what you're getting from Julian Gauthier, adding some uh, some much-needed secondary scoring, some much-needed depth scoring, and we'll see if the Rangers ever look to maybe move him up the lineup. I mean, I don't know what you would do. I mean, could you drop, I, I guess you could drop Jimmy Vesey from the third line to the fourth line if you want to do that, but Vesey himself has played very well recently. Uh, certainly with Kako, I mean, I hope they leave him with Mika and Kreider going forward. Kraftsov, I mean, hey, they bump him out of the second line anyway. If you're going to bump him out of the second line, maybe give Gautier a chance there and see if you can't get him going a little bit. Although Goodrow's played well this season too, so it's a tough call. You know, right now, I, I think Gautier, it's clicking for him a little bit on the fourth line despite a little bit of a lack of playing time, so maybe you just ride with that for a little while going forward, but I like to think the Rangers would maybe keep that in their back pocket, and again, I don't want them to go crazy shuffling the lines again, but I hope that's at least, you know, something that when they do shuffle the lines, which is pretty often, I hope that at least enters the conversation. You know, the idea of maybe moving Julian Gauthier up to the third line or up to the second line. Uh, but we'll see. Like I said, uh, it is shaping up to be the best season of Julian Gauthier's career. That's not setting the bar, the bar very high, but uh, it's better than what the Rangers have been getting out of him in recent seasons. He draws a ton of penalties, too. That's another thing. Uh, when he's on the ice, he seems to force teams into, you know, hooking him, holding him, whatever it might be. That's that uh, special blend of size and speed that Gautier possesses that made him such an intriguing prospect, made him a first-round pick by the Carolina Hurricanes, and made him an intriguing player uh, when the Rangers first traded for him. And obviously, he hasn't quite yet put it together, but uh, here's hoping that Julian Gautier uh, might be finally starting to figure it out at the NHL level at the age of 25 now. Uh, I figure we could pretty much call it there, though. The other thing that I want to mention here, Gustav Riedel was sent back down to the Hartford Wolfpack. Uh, Brodzinski was the healthy scratch for this game. His wife gave birth a couple of days ago, and sounds like everything's good, so that's good to hear. Uh, but Ridal obviously didn't get to play. He was a healthy scratch for just one game. He was out there during uh, you know, the, the warm-up skate, uh, but obviously did not dress for the game. And he'll head back to Hartford, and we'll see if he gets another chance at some point this season. But Gustav Ridal basically on the Rangers for about 24 hours, and then uh, heads back to the Hartford Wolfpack. But uh, just wanted to also take a quick look at the schedule ahead for here for the Rangers. Uh, they are at home against the Wild on Tuesday at 7, home against the Stars on Thursday at 7, home against the Canadians Sunday at 5, and at Jackets on Monday at 7. So I would imagine it'll probably be Eeyore and Eeyore again for the Wild and Stars. I mean, both good teams, and you know, these games are spread out enough that you can keep going with Eeyore. And then probably you get Yaroslav Halak either for the Canadians game on Sunday or the Jackets game on Monday, given that that's a back-to-back. -back. So uh, we'll see how the Rangers look to play it, but obviously, you know, playing a couple of talented teams coming up here in the Wild and the Stars, and uh, very, very um, much looking forward to to seeing how the Rangers hopefully bounce back uh, from what was obviously a disappointing loss here. But that will do it for today, guys. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. And definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that's at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time. Thanks for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. For your second listen, check out Locked On NHL Prospects, your daily podcast covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up to the NHL draft. Locked On NHL Prospects, available on YouTube and wherever you get 
your podcasts.